Hi, everyone. Welcome to Redefine the Circle, a podcast where we discuss all things pitching. I'm Ashley Sunshine, co-owner and head of pitching development at S2 Breakthrough. In this initial series, we're going to highlight topics that focus on how to maximize your pitchers now. We're going to discuss some of the trends that we've seen with our own pitchers at S2 Breakthrough as we've collected more and more data. Some of the topics we'll cover include how we've shifted the way we understand and train pitch types, how to maximize game day prep, and generally how we use data to create systems and approaches that are specific to each pitcher. It's so important for us to continue to share this information and facilitate discussion within the pitching community so we can keep evolving as coaches and ultimately grow pitching into something it's never been before. Thanks so much for listening, and thanks for joining the quest to redefine the circle. This podcast is sponsored by Yakertech, softball's first in-game optical tracking system and most accurate data capturing solution. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode three of Redefine the Circle. I'm Ashley Sunshine, co-owner and head of pitching development at S2 Breakthrough. In today's discussion, uh, we are going to talk about trunk arm timing and its relationship to spin. We've been talking a lot in the last two episodes about how to create spin, what arm position we need to get into from an uh, arm slot and layback, what our hand position looks like on the ball to create spin. But we're going to take it one step, take it back further into how does the trunk contribute to the arm's ability to get into a good slot? And ultimately, how does that impact how pitchers can create spin? So something that I think is interesting is when we're watching pitchers and they're not achieving either the spin or the break that they're that they're shooting for, then oftentimes what we do is we sort of, uh, I don't know if I want to say blame the arm, but we, we kind of isolate the arm or the wrist. We sort of make sure the arm, we're trying to reteach it what it's supposed to be doing. The challenge is a lot of times what's actually occurring when pitchers are not able to achieve what they want on the ball is that the trunk arm timing is off. The trunk essentially is not in appropriate position for the arm to get into position or for the arm to have enough time to unravel and spin the ball the way the pitcher actually wants to. So it is so important for all pitching coaches out there to understand that every one of your uh, pitchers, you want to know whether or not that they, at their neutral, achieve good trunk arm timing. This was just something that when we started off taking, uh, collecting data, collecting research, uh, biomechanics data from pitchers all across the country, there's no doubt about it. The best pitchers, the pitchers who are able uh, to produce the best numbers, meaning uh, they had the most efficient patterns, they were they were able to transfer energy from body to arm to ball the most efficient way. They were able to produce the most variability. They had something in common. They were in good trunk arm timing. And so we're going to talk today just in some detail about what that means, why it's important, um, and, and really talk about how spin needs to be connected to this concept. So when we're referring to trunk arm timing, what we're referring to specifically is when the foot strikes at stride foot contact. So once we're in the air, we're doing our stride, and when the entire foot then makes contact with the ground again, the stride foot, at that time, a pitcher would be in good trunk arm timing if she's just past top of her arm circle and be and before lay back. So she's gonna be in this angle again, sort of little bit, essentially halfway between uh, the top of arm circle and lay back. And the reason why that is so important is because that is the timing in which it takes for the arm to be able to absorb maximum energy from the body. Here's why. When the foot strikes, essentially, the pelvis is sort of done its rotating. It's done its rotating to the degree that uh, it's contributing to deceleration. So as soon as that foot strikes, that's sort of the signal for the body to get the chest to start to rotate back to the target. When the chest begins to rotate back to the target, assuming that the arm is above that layback position, now it has the time it needs to get into the appropriate slot. So chest starts to turn, and in that turn, I get a little bit of extension through the back, and now my arm can fall into a slot. I'm gonna show some examples in just a bit of what it looks like when trunk arm timing is is strong and when it's poor. And essentially, when these two things are not occurring at the right time, 
Uh, let's say, for example, somebody lands. This is the most common one we see. The stride foot lands and the arm is already in layback. So we're in the wrong timing for a variety of reasons. There's a variety of reasons why we see this. But we're already in layback position and the, and the foot has landed. It's happening at the same time. The turn of the chest really, again, the stride foot contact signals for the chest to turn, but layback signals for the arm to start whipping or decelerating to deliver the ball. So essentially, there is no time to rotate for the shoulder to rotate and get into a better arm slot. It's just time to go as soon as that it's the chest time to go. So trunk arm timing, in my mind, is probably the most critical piece when it comes to pitching. Everything we do from load to launch while we're in the air, everything we do early on in the motion is about achieving good trunk arm timing. So in the past, when we have taught pitchers, you know, the goal is to stride out as far as possible. The goal is to stride out, um, you know, get a certain height. What's important to understand is that the goal is actually good trunk arm timing. And everything we do earlier, earlier than that in the motion is about getting in position, spending enough time in the air to allow the arm to get overhead and ultimately to sync up with the body. That is critical. What it, what it takes in order to do that is to get into posture appropriately so that the trunk itself is a good base of rotation, that we're rotating well in the air, and again, that we're able to sync up the arm once we get overhead. So that is just an, a, a topic that I think in itself is just important for us to have. Like when we're teaching our pitchers, we need to know whether or not they naturally get into trunk arm, good trunk arm timing. If not, that should be something that we're really actively trying to work with them on in training. Um, and, and for them to understand like that may or may not be sort of standing in their way of producing some pitchers versus others. Now, of course, there are pitchers out there that have strategies, compensations that are specific to them that help them get away with certain things. There's no doubt about it. That's where when you hear people say, you know, some of the best pitchers, the most elite pitchers are elite compensators. That's sort of the things that they're talking about. Those are the things they're talking about regarding, you know, they get away because their body is able to achieve excessive rotation here, or they can do this. They have a strategy to flip the forearm. There's a variety of things that we see, but generally, the arm's ability to produce variability really is connected to the ability uh, for it to be in sync with the trunk, to be in good trunk arm timing. What we see, and this is probably a discussion for a future episode, but what we see is that, again, that first really important criteria is whether or not the pitcher's in good trunk arm timing. And then the second is whether or not the body can decel uh segmentally sort of on time. Uh, and so a lot of times pitchers will use strategies. If they don't really use the trunk very well, they use strategies like over rotating the, the stride leg or using a lot of like knee drive up in the air, extending the knee, things that sort of buy them time in the air, which ultimately then does get them in good trunk arm timing. The challenge is when it's really not the trunk that's doing its job to get into good trunk arm timing, what often happens then is that at stride foot contact, the, the trunk ends up like collapsing and we don't have good D cell patterns. So our goal is to have, uh, to utilize the right part of the body early on in the motion to get in good trunk arm timing and then for the body to hold up to be able to decel well. That is really how we maximize how we transfer energy from body to arm and ultimately ball. So um, such an important concept, such an important concept. So I just want to show some examples now of, of a pitcher who is in good trunk arm timing and a pitcher who is in poor trunk arm timing and then some of the implications. So let's start with this first example. We have a picture here. Uh, I'm going to get her uh, scrolling through in this video. And what we see here is that as she gets to stride foot contact, remember, whole foot down on the ground, her body will start to resemble like this X position. This X position really is what we're looking for regarding being about halfway between the top of the arm circle and layback position. So now if you continue to watch, what you'll see is that because she's at stride foot contact, that's going to signal to the chest to start rotating back. And then that is going to buy uh, the arm the time it needs to then rotate and get into a slot. I'm going to scroll back and watch it one more time. Stride foot contact comes down. Trunk arm timing checks out. Now that the trunk is turning, 
We're in an arm slot here that allows her to create some, some uh, rotation in the shoulder. Forearm supinates a little bit. It has the time to drive that rotation. And so that is setting her up to not only have a good arm slot at layback, but it's setting her up for variability. So uh, I mentioned earlier that sometimes pitchers will have strategies. So maybe they don't have good trunk arm timing, but the last second they have a strategy where they flip the forearm uh, and they're able to create backspin, for example. But usually those pitchers can't then produce something else. They get stuck in sort of only doing one thing. So this is really a concept where I say the majority of pitchers uh, are really uh, sort of stuck, not being able to produce break very well if they don't good trunk arm timing. For those that then have strategies to do something well, they get stuck as far as their ability to produce variability, multiple spin directions, uh, and so on and so forth. So that's an example of good trunk arm timing. Let's go to the next example. In this example here, uh, as I get this picture rolling, what we're going to see here is that when her stride foot comes down, say whole foot, so we're gonna make sure the heel is down. What you're gonna see is that she's much lower in that arm slot. She's already at layback. So even though the arm wants to drive some rotation, wants to drive some external rotation in the shoulder, some forearm supination, it's out of time. Layback tells the arm it's time to deliver. So you'll see this, the position she gets in on the ball never changes. She's sort of on the side of the ball, stays there at layback. She maybe is trying to drive some external rotation in the shoulder, but she's out of time. So instead, she's just going to deliver from there. And in this example, this pitcher was stuck really throwing bullet spin on every pitch type. And the number one thing that I explained to her is it's not that you need to get in there and do more wrist snaps and spins. The arm is capable of variability. It's out of time in order to rotate in its arm slot and achieve that. There's, a, again, so many different reasons why athletes are do become out of time or uh, why athletes are not in good trunk arm timing. For this particular athlete, it's also, you can see, she sort of over-rotates in the air. There's different things that pitchers do. One really common one that I see is that when it's really not the trunk creating tension between load and launch, pitchers will take their stride leg. And I think there was probably a period of time where we were teaching this as coaches. They'll take their stride leg and try to go for like height and length. They'll do the job of the, of the middle of the body, particularly the pelvis, with their stride leg. And essentially it gets them up really high, their knee is up to their hip. And then by the time that foot lands, it's, it's taking too much time. The stride leg almost always overdoes it. it I, there are rare circumstances where that's not the case, but when the stride leg is driving rotation instead of the pelvis, when the stride leg is driving height and distance instead of the pelvis, it almost always overdoes it. And so it takes too much time. And then ultimately we're in poor trunk arm timing. Okay, so let's think about this. The implications of this when we're in poor trunk arm timing is that we don't have options for variability. The arm doesn't get to segment. It's just sort of locked with where it is and everything comes through together. We also are gonna lose uh, velo because there's not this time for the arm to absorb the energy to sort of allow the trunk to finish decelerating and then send its energy through the arm. If it's all coming through is at one time, then the arm is really not maximizing what it's getting from the trunk. So I think, again, this is just such a critical concept for us as pitching coaches to understand because what I have seen as I've really, uh, as I've dove into so many different biomechanics graphs and ball flight data for pitchers all across the country is that their arm action, you can see it wants to come through. I will often see in their biomechanics that the arm essentially like is starting to segment and then it, it kind of goes away because again, it runs out of time. So I think what we need to understand is very rarely have I seen the arm be the main issue. It's the time it has to do what it needs. Now, another topic that I think is sort of an extension of this topic is the concept of uh, lat mobility, which we've certainly talked a lot about in other forums here at S2 Breakthrough, uh, an educational series we put out a few months ago, we talked a lot about lat mobility, but lat mobility is something that pitchers often, uh, it's a little over 70% of the pitchers that we assess in initial assessment are compromised in lat mobility on their dominant side. The lat has a really big role in getting us overhead. It gets really stretched at layback. It, really has to aggressively work for internal rotation down the whip. So it has a really big role in the pitching motion. And obviously the fact that pitching is so repetitive 
the lat really takes a beating. So for that reason, when we do a lat test for our pitchers, we often see they don't have full lat length, uh, particularly on that dominant side. And so here's why this matters when it comes to trunk arm timing. So a lot of times, in addition to maybe just sort of a natural loss of lat mobility, meaning the reasons I just talked about, the pitcher is just, uh, you know, it's the, the lat is taking a beating and she's throwing so much and has never really paid attention with appropriate warm-ups and strength and conditioning. And so just over time, that lat has started to get locked down. Another reason why the lat sometimes gets locked down is because if the trunk is doing something where it's not taking the time it needs in the air. Maybe power isn't strong enough coming off the, the, the uh, uh, off of load or off of push off. So we're not in the air long enough. Maybe we're not segmenting well, because that's a really tough concept. Basically when the trunk does not take enough time, the body is so smart. It knows that trunk arm timing needs, good trunk arm timing needs to occur. So the arm will shorten itself in order to essentially, that's a strategy to then speed things up, and sync up with strifle contact. That happens a lot. We see that a ton here at S2 Breakthrough. Now, the challenge with that is then when lat mobility gets compromised, then the arm is sort of locked, meaning it doesn't have variability. It only really knows one timing mechanism as far as getting overhead. And this is a challenge. So, you know, we spend a lot of time with our pitchers here at S2 Breakthrough, specifically in strength and conditioning. This is a topic that absolutely we are going to talk about in a future episode because it's just so important on the types of things we're doing for our pitchers to start to unlock lat mobility and give them more variability in the arm. And of course, for those of our pitchers who we have that have clean lat mobility, particularly our young pitchers, number one goal is to preserve that. Because if I have a pitcher who's in poor trunk arm timing, then what I'm trying to do in training is get those two pieces to meet in the middle. I wanna drive some pattern changes. I wanna find out why is the trunk essentially not moving? You know, How can we get it to move a little more optimally? How can we get it to take more the appropriate amount of time, whether it's less time or more time? And we're gonna work on that. We're slowly gonna start to drive pattern changes, particularly through low intensity stuff. Uh, and meanwhile, what I do is then I ask the arm to meet the trunk in the middle. So if I say, okay, I can get a little more out of the trunk when we go at 75% uh, and we're really focused on X, Y, Z patterns. And then I'm also going to give that pitcher a little bit of overload. I'm going to slow the arm down if she's a pitcher that's in, not in good trunk arm timing, because now I'm getting a little bit more from the trunk and now the arm is slowing down and I'm getting a little bit from the arm and now they're in sync. And now I'm starting to train that pitcher of how to get in sync. So when I see a pitcher is not in good trunk arm timing and I look at their mobility profile and the lat is clear, I'm like, yes, because then I know no problem. We just got to drive a little bit of trunk, a little bit of pattern changes. We got to get those two to meet in the middle. She's going to train with a little bit of weighted balls, low intensity. This is going to clean up in no time. And it does. But it's when we see poor trunk arm timing and the lat is locked. Basically, instead of being able to get a little bit of uh, a shift from the arm and a little bit of shift from the trunk, the lat is typically locked. Again, it only has sort of one timing mechanism. So then I know the trunk has to do all the work to meet it, that it's not gonna be meet you in the middle type of training approach. And that's just tougher. It takes more time and it's just tougher. And so uh, this concept of what trunk arm timing is, how important it is, how it affects spin is just so important for us to understand that that really, we're talking patterns, that's the root of it. Is the trunk putting the arm in position to maximize what it can do on the ball? Instead of just isolating the arm and thinking about the wrist and hand position alone, we have to understand as a pitching community that oftentimes the arm is just being blocked. The levers are at the mercy of the trunk. And so getting in that timing, allowing the arm to access a good slot so then it in turn can access different, unravel at different times and access lots of variability on the ball, that always is going to come down to that trunk arm timing piece. So again, wanted to share a little bit about the importance uh, of trunk arm timing, the importance of, of or the relationship between lat mobility and trunk arm timing when it comes to how we train it. I think understanding these concepts, they're just the types of things that we talk about and we deal with uh, that we program for every day at S2 Breakthrough. And I think as a pitching community, it's time for all of us to start being discussions where we're understanding how all of these puzzle pieces really fit together. 
Thank you so much for joining today. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you learned a little bit of something here on episode three. Uh, Looking forward to continuing this conversation over these next couple of weeks about ball flight, about some of the things that we have seen and learned uh, here at S2 Breakthrough. Again, thanks for joining and I'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to today's episode. I'd love to connect and hear your feedback. You can contact me directly at ashley at s2breakthrough.com. If you're listening, you can leave us a review. Or if you're watching, go ahead and leave a comment below. Also, be sure to follow S2 Breakthrough on all of our social media channels and subscribe to Stream S2 to find all things player development. Until next time, quest on. Quest on.